Hi, in the first of my lectures today, I'm going to talk about the evidence basis for stents or surgery in coronary artery disease in 2013. I'm going to do this with specific reference to some of the newer trials like Syntax and Freedom. And towards the end of the lecture, I would like to discuss a little about the actual practice and politics of coronary artery bypass grafting as we currently practice it. At the start of this lecture, declare some potential conflicts of interest, but none of them are really relevant to this presentation. The first thing I would like to start is by emphasizing that the contemporary results of coronary artery bypass grafting are excellent. This was a paper, the one year outcome of the arterial revascularization trial, which was a randomized trial of 3,000 patients to single or bilateral IMA grafts where the primary outcome is 10-year survival. We hope, in fact, to publish the five-year results in January 2014. But this trial was conducted by 67 surgeons in 28 centres in seven countries. And the striking thing to note is that the 30-day mortality for the whole trial was 1.2% and the one-year mortality 2.4%. And the one-year instance of stroke MI and repeat revascularization were all under 2%. As I've said, we hope to publish the five-year results in January 2014, but it is still worth noting that as we practice today, only 5% of patients in the United States and fewer than 10% in Europe actually receive bilateral IMA grafts. A second point to make is if we look at the current status of routine use of coronary stent implantation with or without optimal medical therapy, this is a meta-analysis of eight trials with almost 8,000 patients and a mean follow-up of four years. And the authors conclude that initial stent implantation for stable coronary artery disease shows no evidence of benefit compared with initial medical therapy for prevention of death non-fatal MI, unplanned revascularization, or angina. It's also important to be aware that when we look at the evidence basis for any intervention, in this case, cabbage or stents, that we can consider two forms of evidence. Unquestionably, the randomized control trial is the gold standard because it eliminates bias. But randomized trials may also have potential weaknesses. They often have small numbers of patients. They only include a small percentage of the total potentially eligible population. They often therefore end up with atypical patient populations. This is compounded by short durations of follow-up and large numbers of crossovers. And that statement is true for 19 out of the 20 randomized trials of cabbage versus stents. The other form of evidence is that provided from large propensity match registries. These have the advantage that they often include tens of thousands of patients and they actually represent real clinical practice. But of course, their major potential weakness is confounding or biased by factors that we might know about, but also by factors that we may not know about. Now, if we look at the evidence from randomized trials of stents versus cabbage before syntax, this was summarized in this collaborative analysis of individual patient data by Halatke and colleagues published in The Lancet in 2009. They looked at 10 randomized trials with almost 8,000 patients and a median follow-up of six years. They found that the hazard ratio for death with cabbage was lower at 0.91, but this did not reach statistical significance. However, in two subgroups of patients, those with diabetes or those over 65 years of age, there did indeed seem to be a strong survival advantage with coronary artery bypass grafting. The caution on this analysis, however, is that this only included highly selected patients and indeed 95% of the total potentially eligible population were excluded from the trials. Now, back in 2006, I was privileged to give the Ferguson Lecture to the STS in the United States. And the title of my paper was Cabbage is still the best treatment for multivessel and left main disease, but patients need to know. In that analysis, 
I summarized 15 randomized trials of stents versus coronary artery bypass grafting. And the key points that I made were that although in total these trials involved almost 9,000 patients, they were a very highly selected population. Only 5% of the total potentially eligible population were enrolled. Two thirds of patients had single or double vessel disease with normal left ventricular function. Only 40% of patients had proximal LED disease. So when these trials all individually reported that there was no survival benefit of cabbage over PCI, the first thing we can say is that this was entirely predictable because the trials had only included a population in whom it was already well established that there was no prognostic benefit from any kind of revascularization. Secondly, the trials were then mispresented in the medical literature as if they were applicable to all patients with multivessel coronary disease, and this led to the inevitable explosive growth in PCI. The only exception to all of these randomized trials is the SYNTAX trial, a relative all-comer trial, which we will discuss subsequently. Now, if we turn away from the trials and look at propensity match registries, over the similar period to when the trials were being conducted, there have now been 10 large propensity match registries involving over 300,000 patients. They include a mixture of patients with and without diabetes, treated by either bare metal or drug eluting stents, and with follow-ups ranging from one to 10 years. But in these propensity match registries of real life, everyday clinical patients, they consistently show that by three to five years, there is an absolute survival advantage in favor of cabbage by around 5% and accompanied by a marked reduction in the need for repeat intervention. This therefore is an important warning for what we might expect to see in the syntax trial. Now if you look at one of these registries, this is the New York registry of almost 60,000 patients with at least two vessel disease, propensity match for both cardiac and non-cardiac comorbidity. And we can see that within three years of treatment, there is an absolute survival advantage in favour of cabbage by around five percentage points. And we can also see when we look at these survival curves that they are continuing to diverge at three years, suggesting that with further follow-up, the benefit of cabbage may be even greater. And this was accompanied by a seven-fold reduction in the need for repeat intervention with cabbage. So what we learn from this is that with cabbage, both survival and freedom from repeat revascularization increase with duration of follow-up. And we should be very cautious of taking any conclusions or interpretations of studies with less than three years follow-up. If you look at one paper with the longest individual follow-up, this is by Wu and colleagues published in Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2011. They looked at 7,235 pairs of patients, propensity matched for 32 factors, and followed for eight years. And they found at eight years an overall survival advantage in favor of cabbage by seven percentage points. But when they sub-analyzed their patients according to whether the patients had two or three vessel disease, with or without proximal LED disease, they found that in every category of disease, there was a survival advantage for cabbage. And the greatest survival advantage was in those patients with the most severe disease. In other words, three vessel disease, including proximal left anterior descending disease. Now, while this study was conducted with bare metal stents, we will show that drug eluting stents do not have a survival advantage over bare metal stents. So we would not expect any significantly different finding if the patients had been treated with drug eluting stents. <clears throat> and this shows the individual follow-up of these patients extending over an eight-year period. And what we can see is that the survival advantage of cabbage increases with increasing duration of follow-up. In what is the most powerful individual propensity match registry, the ACERT registry, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, the authors looked at almost 190,000 patients 
from both the ACC and STS databases. And what this showed was that at a median follow-up of four years, there was an absolute survival advantage in favour of cabbage by four and a half percentage points. And again, notice that the survival curves continue to diverge in favour of cabbage. And it is noteworthy in the ASSERT registry of the patients undergoing stenting, almost 80% received drug eluting stents. When the authors analysed these patients, because of the statistical power of having so many patients, 190,000, when they looked at subgroups according to age, above or below 75, gender, body mass index, race, the presence or absence of diabetes, lung dysfunction, peripheral vascular disease, prior myocardial infarction, renal dysfunction, when they looked at ejection fraction according to good, moderate or poor, the overall risk and the severity of coronary artery disease in every single category, there was a strong survival advantage in favour of bypass grafting. So we will now come to the syntax trial because this landmark trial is unquestionably the most important trial ever performed of stenting versus cabbage. The five-year outcomes for death and MACE were published in The Lancet in February 22, 2013. And the two major strengths of the Syntax trial are that first, it was an all-comer trial, and this means it's in marked contrast to all the previous trials where the patients were very highly selected. Another thing to note with Syntax is that it contained a nested parallel registry to look at what happened to patients who were deemed, for whatever reason, ineligible for randomization. And it is noteworthy that one third of all patients went straight to bypass grafting because the severity of their disease was considered too complex to be even considered for stenting. Now, if you look at the five year results of syntax for three vessel disease, we can see that there is an immediate five and a half percent absolute survival benefit in favor of cabbage. There is a marked reduction in the instance of cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and need for repeat revascularization with cabbage. And note, there is no difference in the incidence of stroke between stenting and cabbage at five years. And we shouldn't be surprised by these results because they are entirely consistent with what the propensity match registries have been telling us for the last decade. When we examine the patients in terms of the complexity of the coronary artery disease into low, intermediate and high risk groups, we can see that only in the low risk group there is no difference between death for PCI and cabbage, although cabbage was associated with reduced repeat revascularization. But if we look at the intermediate group, we see a 7% survival advantage for cabbage, and in the high risk group, a 9% survival advantage for cabbage accompanied by marked reductions in the incidence of myocardial infarction and the need for repeat revascularization. And when you look at the survival curves of syntax, they continue to diverge at five years, implying that with further duration of follow-up, the benefits of cabbage may be even greater. Now, if we turn to the situation for left main, back in 2008, myself and several authors from Europe and the United States co-authored this paper, which reviewed all the evidence for left main, both for stenting and coronary artery bypass grafting that was available at that time. And we concluded that cabbage should remain the preferred revascularization treatment in good surgical candidates with unprotected left main stem stenosis. And we based that on two fairly basic pathophysiological observations which were that up to 90% of left main lesions are distal or bifurcation lesions, and we know that these are at very high risk of restenosis. And also up to 90% of patients with left main also have multi-vessel coronary artery disease, where bypass grafting already offers a survival benefit independent of the presence of left main disease. So if we now turn and look at what did syntax shows at five years for left main disease, we can see that now there is no difference in the instance of death between PCI and cabbage. And cabbage does result in a minor reduction in both cardiac death and myocardial infarction. 
a more marked reduction in repeat revascularization, but at the higher cost of stroke, being 4.3% for cabbage and 1.5% for stenting. So this is different from what we saw for patients with three vessel disease without left main. Again, if we analyze these patients according to complexity of coronary artery disease, we can see that in the low and intermediate groups, the risk of death is actually lower with stents than with cabbage, whereas in the high-risk group, we see an opposite effect where there seems to be a marked increase in the risk of death with stenting. Cabbage also in the high-risk groups results in a threefold reduction in the need for repeat revascularization. So currently, the XL trial is ongoing. This is a trial sponsored by Abbott Vascular, and it plans to enroll 2,600 patients with syntax scores below 33. In other words, patients with low or intermediate severity left main. As of to date, over half the patients have now been randomized, and we expect recruitment to finish for this trial within the next nine to 10 months. If we turn and look at diabetic patients, in the Helatki meta-analysis of almost 8,000 patients, 1,233 had diabetes. And if we look at the outcome of these patients in terms of stenting or cabbage, we can see an absolute difference in survival by 10 percentage points in favour of cabbage by eight years. So the hazard ratio for death with cabbage was highly statistically significant. And again, we see the same phenomenon that the survival benefit of cabbage increases with increasing duration of follow-up. If we look at the FREEDOM trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, this is the most definitive trial of stenting and cabbage in patients with diabetes, enrolling just under 2,000 patients. At five years, there was an absolute reduction in overall MACE by eight percentage points in favour of cabbage, but even more importantly, there was an absolute survival advantage of 5.4% for patients undergoing bypass grafting. And again, we see the phenomenon of the survival curves continuing to diverge as we increase the duration of follow-up. If we stop at this point and ask the fundamental question, why does cabbage have such a survival benefit over PCI? It's because anatomically, atheroma is mainly located in the proximal coronary arteries and this has two important implications for treatment. During bypass grafting, the conduits are placed to the mid-coronary vessel, and this achieves two effects. The first is that it makes the complexity of the proximal culprit lesion irrelevant. And secondly, over the longer term, cabbage offers prophylaxis against future culprit lesions by protecting whole zones of vulnerable proximal myocardium in what is diffusely unstable coronary endothelium. In contrast, PCI using stents can only treat suitable localized proximal culprit lesions, but has no prophylactic benefit against new disease, which develops either proximal to, within, or distal to the stent, all of which would serve to nullify the benefit of the stent. The second thing to take note of is that stenting usually means incomplete revascularization, and Hannon showed in a series of almost 22,000 patients undergoing stenting that 70% had incomplete revascularization, and the subsequent mortality of these patients correlated directly with the degree of incompleteness of revascularization. So for these two reasons, we can say that stenting is unlikely to ever match the result of cabbage for most patients with left main or multivessel disease. It didn't with plain old balloon angioplasty, it didn't with bare metal stents, and it has not done so with drug looting stents. If we go back and look at what the guidelines said when I was privileged to give the Ferguson lecture in 2006, I've summarized the recommendations for stenting by the ACC and AHA, the European Society of Cardiology and the British Cardiac Society. And essentially, they all said that almost all patients could be treated by stenting, and none of these guidelines recommended the patient even have the benefit of a surgical opinion. But if we look at who wrote these guidelines, the Americans used 23 cardiologists and a single surgeon. 
The Europeans used 46 cardiologists and no sergeants, so they doubled the number of cardiologists and got rid of the single sergeant the Americans had. And the British used eight cardiologists and a single sergeant. But in total, this meant the guidelines were written by 77 cardiologists and two sergeants. And let me remind you, they were all based on those very highly selected trials of PCI versus cabbage. Now, if we go on to what's happening today, I think things have improved substantially. These are the 2010 guidelines from combined between the European Society of Cardiology and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery. They included 25 members from 13 European countries, including nine non-interventional cardiologists, eight interventional cardiologists, and eight cardiac surgeons. And we can see that the composition of this reflects the concept of the heart team. And these guidelines were extensively reviewed by external referees before publication. Now, if we look at the guidelines and say, what do they actually recommend? They recommend first in terms of whether there should be a heart team for left main or complex coronary artery disease. And then they divide the anatomical complexity of coronary artery disease into nine categories. So if we now look and say, what do the guidelines actually recommend? They make recommendations according to whether a heart team should be employed, certainly for most left main or complex coronary artery disease. And they then divide the anatomical complexity of coronary disease into nine categories. If we look at the recommendations for cabbage, according to ESC, EX and ACC, we can see that the vast majority of recommendations are class 1A or B, meaning this is what we should be doing for most patients. If we look at the recommendations for stenting, we can see that most of the boxes are now either yellow, brown or red. And remember, red is a class 3 indication, meaning you should not do it. So if we look at three vessel disease, as we practice today, 79% of patients have syntax scores above 22, meaning that for almost the majority, the great majority of patients with complex three vessel disease, these patients should only be treated by coronary artery bypass grafting. And if you look at patients with left main disease with syntax scores above 32, this accounts for almost two thirds of all patients with left main disease. Again, these patients should only be treated by cabbage unless there is a contraindication to bypass grafting or the patient does not wish to have an operation. If we now look a bit more detail at the practice and politics of stenting and cabbage, this slide shows the ratio of elective PCI to cabbage per 100,000 of population in 24 OECD countries. So these are countries with relatively similar economic status. We can see that the median for the whole OECD is 3.29. But if you look at Germany, Hungary, United States, Italy, France and Spain towards the lower end of the graph, we can see that the ratio of PCI to cabbage increases from 4 to almost 9. So throughout these relatively similar countries in terms of economic status, there is a fourfold difference in the ratio of PCI to cabbage. And this doesn't just happen at country level, it happens within countries. If we look at this paper published about events in Ontario in Canada in 17 cardiac centres, we can see that there is a five-fold difference in the ratio of PCI to cabbage depending on which hospital you're admitted to. The authors of this paper interpreted that the physician performing the diagnostic catheterization and the treating hospital were strong independent predictors of the mode of revascularization. Opportunities exist to improve transparency and consistency around the decision-making process for coronary revascularization, most notably among patients with non-emergent multivessel disease. And if you look at what happens in the United Kingdom, where we have a national health service, this is a study looking at the ratio of elective PCI to cabbage per 100,000 of population in 151 primary care trusts. And we can see that the median PCI cabbage ratio is 1.19, but the minimum is 0.36 and the maximum is 4.74. So within the United Kingdom, 
there is a 13-fold difference between the minimum and the maximum performing PCI to cabbage ratio. And the interesting thing is that this minimum and maximum performing geographical area were only 40 miles apart. So what happens if we have no heart team or no guidelines? This actually leads to an increase in the rate of wrong interventions. This is a paper by Hannon looking at 16,000 cath lab patients in New York treated in 2005 to 7, when the treatment decision was made by the cath lab cardiologist alone in 64% of cases. And what we can see is that even if you had a class one recommendation for cabbage according to ACC AHA guidelines, only half the patients received cabbage and one third still had PCI. In contrast, if you had a class one recommendation for PCI, then 94% of patients had PCI. And if there was true equipoise between cabbage and PCI, still 93% of patients received PCI. The authors went on to point out that 92% of the PCI procedures were ad hoc. In other words, there was no real time for the patient to evaluate potential choices and different treatment options. And by performing ad hoc PCI, this undermines the concept of true genuine consent. The authors also pointed out that the chance of PCI increases in hospitals with PCI facilities. Now, in an editorial to accompany that paper, Ray Gibbons wrote in his circulation commentary, a final potential explanation, and in my view the most concerning, is that these recommendations for PCI in patients indicated for cabbage reflect a grow the business and make it up on volume mentality in response to declining reimbursement rates. There are compelling financial incentives for cardiologists performing interventions to do more procedures, even when the patient might be better treated with cabbage. And when he goes on to explore the question of should patients receive a routine surgical opinion, he says, in such patients, surgical consultation should be considered, but not mandated. But this really goes against what he had said previously about the compelling financial incentives for cardiologists to perform more interventional procedures. If you look at the appropriateness of percutaneous coronary intervention, this is from the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, looking at half a million PCIs in 1,091 US hospitals. And they point out that in 29% of the interventions, which were not acute, only 50% were deemed to be appropriate, with 38% being uncertain and 12% being inappropriate. The reasons some interventions were deemed inappropriate was because the patients didn't have angina, there was no evidence of ischemia, and patients were on suboptimal medication. And the median rate of inappropriate interventions was 11%, but from hospital to hospital, it varied from 0 to 55%. Now, what myself and one of my colleagues in Oxford performed a review of the literature looking at informed consent after patients had received interventions. We identified 10 studies with almost 1,500 patients, of whom 1,000 had undergone PCI and 440 bypass grafting. And what is remarkable is when patients were asked why they had undergone the intervention, if we look at PCI in orange, Almost 70% of patients said that PCI would extend their life expectancy and prevent further myocardial infarction. But these are two things that we know PCI certainly does not do. Notice also that only 15% of PCI patients were offered any alternative therapies, even although most of these patients had multivessel coronary artery disease. This shows that there is a widespread misunderstanding of the rationale for PCI. Again, I would emphasize that almost 85% of patients undergoing stenting were not offered any alternative treatment, even although these were stable patients with multivessel disease. And this again emphasizes the, the need to have guidelines and a multidisciplinary team approach to recommending interventions. So if I summarize and conclude this talk, I would say that as we practice today, almost 80% of patients with three-vessel disease have syntax scores above 22, 
and two-thirds of all patients with left main disease have syntax scores above 32, and these patients have been shown to have a strong survival advantage with bypass grafting by three years, and a survival advantage that continues to increase past five years. It is certainly possible to improve both the results of PCI and cabbage, and we will talk about this in another lecture. There is consistent unwarranted variation in the ratios of PCI to cabbage, both between countries and within countries. There is strong evidence that the absence of a heart team using approved guidelines results both in the majority of elective PCI patients failing to understand the rationale for the procedure and also a large number of inappropriate or wrong PCI interventions. I believe that guidelines are transparent and they protect not only the interests of the patients against receiving the wrong intervention, but they also protect and ensure that doctors do what is likely to be in the best interests of patients, and I feel therefore should be mandatory. Finally, I would say that professional bodies should persuade statutory bodies and payers that they will only pay for interventions which are approved by the heart team based on official guidelines or where there is documentation as to why guidelines have not been followed. Otherwise, interventions should not be reimbursed. On that point, I'm going to conclude this talk. I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. Thank you.